recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is uh, to the Premier. Yesterday, as the Premier and I were meeting in his office, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, and the Federal Minister of Health said it was safe to assume that 30 to 70 per cent of, Canadians, or of Canada's population uh, could become infected. The Premier has stated, quote, we have a plan for every scenario. Uh, at this point, information about these contingencies is vital for families. So my question is, when will the government start laying out the details of these plans? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the opposition for the question. I can tell you that our government is absolutely committed to making sure that Ontarians have the information that they need and our frontline workers. We are putting together a command table to make sure that everyone is informed. And this situation is evolving. It will change day to day. Our most important thing we can do right now is containment. And that's what our plan is about. We have a command table. We have response teams. We are making sure we're working with, working with Public Health Ontario and, and PHAC. And up to $100 million in a response fund was announced by the Premier. Uh, just yesterday to include our re readiness and response to COVID-19. Ontario's command table has been refining and finalizing plans for enhanced measures, and I can tell you, as the Minister of Long-Term Care, we are on this. We are making sure our, our active screening is occurring in all our Bonds. homes, and the enhanced access to screening, the dedicated assessment centres, the physician billing codes, the launching of a self-assessment tool. This situation is evolving, and this government has a plan, and we're acting on it. Here, here. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, health experts have urged the government to share information about planning so people can be prepared and so that the resources needed to confront this pandemic are being properly allocated. Speaker, people are hungry. They're hungry for information. Parents are wondering what will happen at schools, many of which are already in, poor, in a poor state of repair. Shelters need to know support will be there to protect especially vulnerable populations. Telehealth Ontario has waits as long as 11 to 15 hours for people seeking information. Will the Premier commit to laying out the government's contingency plans to address these concerns as soon as possible? Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for this important question. I can tell you that our government is actively creating screening centres at hospitals across Ontario that will be separate from the hospitals themselves. This will be in special locations across Ontario, and we we'll want to make sure that the telehealth issue is resolved. Our government is committing additional resources to make sure that telehealth is responsive and staffed properly and, in, and responsive in a timely way. So we're working very closely with telehealth to ensure that they have the adequate supports. Containment is of the utmost importance right now, and that will require advanced screening and that people have the proper communication tools at hand. Communication, communication, communication. Our government understands that and is acting on it. We are committed to allocating additional resources to telehealth as needed, Response. and we are making sure that we will review virtual care options as well. Virtual care uptake through the command table is being assessed, and, and our command table, our regional tables, provincial table are working hard as we speak. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, there's, there's definitely no doubt that families are especially concerned about the ability of Ontario's health system to, co uh, to cope with the dramatic increase in people <coughs> seeking medical care. Uh, we know that hospitals are already routinely stretched well beyond their capacity. And despite promises of ending hallway medicine, the government's continued to, fund, uh, to freeze funding, uh, and that leaves hospitals treating patients uh, in hallways and board boardrooms to this very day. So will the government be announcing their plans uh, to support hospitals as COVID-19 spreads, and if so, will that include the announcement of new additional funding resources for hospitals? Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you for the question. Our government is working closely with our counterparts and collaborating with different levels of government, including our public health agencies and the federal government. The federal government has announced $1 billion uh, to help provinces uh, to address this issue, so we'll be looking forward to how that will best be used for our hospitals. Our first wave of assessment centres is established at Brampton Civic, the Ottawa Hospital, North York General, Mackenzie Health, Scarborough Health Network and Trillium Health Partners. 
and these centers will uh, help with the testing that is so badly needed right now and our government is doing everything possible to make sure that people are adequately screened and active screening is taking place we are making sure that ontarians have access to credible up-to-date information and the public education campaign is up and running uh, for resources you can go to ontario.ca coronavirus updated twice daily at 10 30 and 5 30 seven days a week our website provides relevant information in 30 different languages communication 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 of our plan ongoing swift action is thank you very much the next question, once again, leader of the opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, also for the Premier. The Ford government's decision to make sick notes mandatory and strip workers of sick paid days or paid sick days uh, was concerning to. Uh, both health experts and working people when it was passed two years ago. Now, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, it poses even more serious threats to public health. This, mount, this morning, doctors uh, here at Queen's Park, doctors, nurses, and other health prov providers spoke out uh, in a press conference urging the government to reverse their changes to these policies. Will the government do that? Minister of Care. Thank you. Speaker, and thank you for the question. I want to reiterate our government's commitment to the safety and well-being of all Ontarians and our frontline workers. And that's why we are looking at asking the federal government to increase the health transfers to 5%. This is really important that we understand how different levels of government can contribute to this. We're all in this together. This is not a time for vitriol. This is a time for active and, and responsive caring and compassion for each one of us. We all have responsibility for our own health and the health of others. And we're recommending that people who feel ill stay at home and that we encourage employers to support that advice. This is a time for unity. This is a time for working together. This is a time for caring and not vitriol. Employers have the option to require reasonable proof of the circumstances that entitle Response. the employee to leave. Our government will continue to work with our federal counterparts to coordinate our response to COVID-19, and that includes addressing the needs of our frontline workers. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Well, Speaker, what we're asking this government to do is to roll back their decision on mandatory sick notes or on sick notes being required in this province writ large, every employer should not be asking any worker for a sick note, and we should, want, we should make sure that those workers have paid sick days to be able to rely on so that their financial ability is maintained. And you know, it's not just us, of course. Doctors, nurses, and public health specialists are all speaking out for a simple reason, Speaker. There is no point, no point whatsoever, in telling workers to take time away from work if their work won't allow that to happen. They're calling for paid sick days, emergency leave, and an end to mandatory sick notes. We have already made it clear that we will work with this government to ensure legislation rolling back these policies passes quickly in this House. Why is the government refusing to adopt these common-sense measures that are coming from all kinds of different sources in terms of recommendations? Thank you. Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, and thank you to the Leader of, Oppos uh, of the Opposition for that question. I can assure her that we are uh, monitoring the situation uh, minute by minute uh, here in the province and across the country. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I encourage uh, employers to be uh, reasonable, to be responsible, and the ones I've spoken to have uh, acted that way. But, Mr. Speaker, um, I also want to uh, highlight what the Premier uh, just said this morning. He is in Ottawa meeting with the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, all the Premiers and territorial uh, leaders. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he first off uh, thanked the Prime Minister for the $1 billion in funding uh, to the provinces and territories. He also uh, uh, asked the Prime Minister and the federal government to uh, increase uh, transfers uh, to Ontario by uh, just over 5 per cent per year. And I'll have more to say uh, in the next answer. Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect, monitoring and encouragement is not leadership on a file like this. We need leadership and we need the government to act. People who can't afford to take a sick day from work 
are not going to take a sick day. People who could lose their job if they take a sick day will go to work. They will not take a day off. No one should have to choose between their job and their health. No one. And that choice puts all of our health at risk. The Ford government knows that their current laws put the public at risk, put public health at risk. Now is the time to change those laws in the midst of the situation that we are facing. Why are the, is this government refusing to make the changes that are being, re being recommended by experts? The changes need to happen. It's not about encouragement. It's not about simply monitoring. Question. Make the changes. Minister of Labour again reply. Well, thank you again, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the member opposite knows, our government added three new types of leave, uh, sick leave, family responsibility leave, and bereavement leave. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, we need everyone uh, working together uh, on this issue. This is a, a global challenge for uh, every single person uh, across the, uh, the globe. I want to uh, also pay tribute to our frontline uh, health care workers who are working uh, every single day for the health and well-being of the people of this province. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I also want to commend uh, the Deputy Premier of Ontario, the Health Minister, Christine Elliott, who is doing an outstanding job communicating uh, this uh, issue with all the people of the province, and as well thank the Chief, Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province of Ontario, who is working very, very closely Response. right across the government with all ministers. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, we're monitoring this situation minute by minute. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. Like everyone, families in my community of Brampton are worried about the COVID-19 pandemic. But Brampton has been struggling with a health care challenge for, year, for years. Before the COVID-19 outbreak, Brampton City Council declared a health care emergency because our, our hospital routinely operates beyond capacity. Yesterday, the Premier claimed that he had a plan for every scenario regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Given the chronic underfunding, underfunding of Brampton Civic, the thousands of people treated in our hospitals' hallways and the health care crisis declared by the City of Brampton. What is this government's plan to meet Brampton's health care needs? My question is to the Premier. Mr. Long-Term Care, reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that question. Health, hallway health care is a complex issue, and hospitals across Ontario are, have been feeling the pressures for many years. Under the previous government, very little was done to address that for 15 long years. So due to the previous government's mismanagement, we are dealing with this reality now. Our government's campaign promise was to relieve hallway health care, and we've been diligently working on that ever since. We know that there's many pieces to this, and our, our efforts have included investing millions and billions of dollars into our health care system, $384 million in our hospital sector to maintain critical hospital capacity, increase access to highly specialized and innovative treatments, and support the volume. We have an aging population, a grow growing population, and the neglect of 15 Response. years of the previous government takes time to settle. Our estimates suggest that these investments will help. It will take time. I appreciate your concerns. Thank you. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier. The people of Brampton see the incredible work our public health teams are doing to protect our community, but they also know that our local health system is facing tremendous strains already. Hallway medicine has been a fact of life in Brampton under Conservative and Liberal governments. Will the government commit the resources Brampton needs to meet the COVID-19 pandemic? and permanent, permanently, permanently stop the hallway medicine emergency in our city. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, in the case of Brampton, I, we've announced the first wave of assessment centres will be established at the Brampton Civic. That is one of the hospitals that will be included. 
these uh, the the active screening processes the treatment centers the testing capacity is being ramped up it will be ramped up across ontario and we're working with public health ontario we recognize that covid covid-19 is novel we are learning every day about the issues associated with it and understanding the science and the evidence behind how we respond to it we have amazing people working non-stop at public health ontario and our federal counterpart as well making sure that our frontline providers, as well as long-term care homes, are equipped and ready to deal with it. We've launched a province-wide public education campaign, Bonds. and we want to make sure that everyone understands we're all in this together. We have to work together to solve this issue. It will take all our resources and all of our compassion. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. The mental health and well-being of police and other first responders in Ontario is incredibly important to all Ontarians. I want to thank all the frontline police officers that keep us safe every day. I was pleased last year that the Solicitor General commissioned an external independent review panel to review and report back on the workplace culture of the OPP. And I'm glad that this week the Solicitor General shared the report, its recommendations, and an update of our government's progress in implementing those recommendations. Speaker. Can the Solicitor General share with this House the circumstances that led to her commissioning this report? The Solicitor General. Thank you, and thank you to the member from Burlington. You know, I know that there are many uh, colleagues on this side of the House and on the other side that have had a long and uh, focused interest on well-being, particularly related to mental health, and of course now in my current role uh, as it relates to our frontline officers. Uh, the tragic deaths that have occurred over a number of years in OPP ranks uh, led us as a government last April to uh, strike a commission. And this independent panel has um, done some excellent work. Uh, this will not be easy work for us to do, but it is critically important to ensure that our frontline officers, uh, when they need help, when they reach out, uh, the assistance is there. And I am so pleased that uh, we are Response. working in uh, cooperation with OPP Commissioner Creek and his management team. Uh, equally important, Rob Jamieson is the president of the Ontario Provincial Police Association. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you so much, Speaker. Thank you to the Solicitor General for that response and for all your hard work. I'm proud that our government, under the leadership of this Solicitor General and Premier Ford, has been taking action on this critically important issue. Speaker, the review panel's report makes it clear that action is required to improve the workplace culture at the OPP. Our dedicated and selfless frontline heroes deserve nothing less than our absolute commitment leadership and support. I'm confident yeah. that our Solicitor General, our Premier, and our entire government is committed to doing the necessary work to get this right. Can the Solicitor General share how we are taking action in response to the recommendations of the Independent Review Panel? Thank you, Speaker. Solicitor General, to reply. Thank you, and thank you for raising this. It gives me an opportunity to talk about the very uh, positive things that we have already begun to do. You know, this report truly is a turning point in the transition to a healthier, more positive and supportive workplace. The reviewers made 66 recommendations, Speaker, and of that, 42 are already complete, in progress, are well underway. So it speaks to the commitment that Commissioner Karik is the head of the OPP, Rob Jamieson as the head of the OPP Association, and uh, our government has to ensure that people have the supports where and when they need it. And in the coming weeks and months, you will find that uh, there are new and exciting um, announcements that will be made that add to what the Independent Review Panel has recommended. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, as Ontarians are watching the developments around the uh, COVID-19 pandemic unfold, 
Uh, there is understandably growing concern among parents and guardians about protections for our kids in our school system. While so far the virus has had very limited impact on children younger than 10, the nature of the children of children's interactions uh, could increase the risk of transmission in schools. Can the Premier tell the House what steps the government is taking to support school boards and families as they deal with the threat of COVID-19? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. The health and well-being of Ontarians, including students and school staff, is Ontarians, Ontario's top priority. Students, parents, school communities should rest assured that we are working together in close cooperation with partners in both the education and health care sectors to ensure the continued safety of students and staff. In the course of case and contact management, public health units can contact employers, schools, restaurants, and places of business. And this is a completely normal part of Ontario's response to COVID-19. And it means our system is working. Our government will continue to keep school boards up to date on the current situation and work to contain COVID-19. We all have a role to play in this. We all have respect and responsibility for our own health and the health of others. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the minister for that response. I, I, I have to say, though, I was hoping we would get a little bit more detail here in the House about what's happening now. Uh, what we're hearing is that uh, there are going to be regular calls starting after March break. Uh, that is concerning, I think, for a lot of us. Uh, we want to know that this is happening now, that there's a plan in place, and that there's complete transparency. Um, School boards are already taking, as we know, extra precautions to guard against outbreaks. Custodians are logging extra hours. Extra cleaning and sanitizing supplies are being ordered. But at a time when we've seen school boards squeezed and custodial staff laid off, the government needs to be prepared to provide resources as necessary. During the H1N1 outbreak, the province provided additional funds to offset these extra costs for boards. Is this government prepared to do the same for COVID-19? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I think we all have a shared interest in ensuring the safety of our students and our staff in our schools, Speaker. And that's why on the first case, the presumptive positive case of COVID-19, I asked uh, with the support of the Minister of Health and Deputy Premier to get the Chief Medical Health Officer to speak to every Director of Education on the Sunday, the day after of that first case. Information is flowing in real time. We have constant dialogue with directors and our stakeholders within the system to ensure staff and students remain safe. Of course, Speaker, we have increased the heightened vigilance in schools to ensure the safety of our personnel. The government, federal government as well, has provided guidelines surrounding best practices to keep safe. We are obviously going to continue to have those discussions in real time with the directors of education in consultation with the chief medical health officer to ensure that every student, every staff member on Ontario remains safe. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Speaker, COVID-19 is a challenge we're all facing together, and we do, I think, on all sides, appreciate the government's invitation to yesterday's briefing on the government's efforts and some updates. My question relates to the $100 million contingency fund that the Premier announced yesterday. So, Speaker, three, my questions are, and there are two, is the $100 million contingency fund solely for anticipated health care costs? And secondly, is the money allocated in this fiscal year, or is it the anticipated contingency in the upcoming budget? Thank you, Speaker. Government House Leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the question from uh, from the honourable member, and just let me uh, thank both himself, uh, the leader of the Green Party, and leader of the opposition, uh, for making themselves available for a, a briefing with the, the Premier, Minister of Finance, and uh, and the Minister of Health uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, the initial uh, funding that was announced by the uh, the Minister of Finance is directed for uh, to preserve and protect uh, health care. Uh, it uh, will be made uh, available, obviously, immediately. Uh, we are continuing to monitor the situation. Uh, it is an initial initial contribution. We are obviously monitoring the situation very, very closely, and if more steps need to be taken, the government stands ready to make those uh, uh, additional uh, uh, resources available. Thank you. 
The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the uh, uh, the minister for his answer, or the House leader for his answer. And uh, you know, I, I appreciate the clarity, and Ontarians will need further clarity as to the government's contingencies going forward for both health care costs and the economic impacts uh, that are going to be felt in this province. And I would encourage the government to be open-minded uh, about those potential impacts. So um, we all know the public health advice that we're getting, uh, that we can all participate in, which is wash your hands, don't touch your face, right? If you're sick, stay home, practice social distancing, call if you're concerned. But we know next week is March break and millions of kids are going to be off and they're going to be there with their families. And I know the Premier said this morning he wants families to have a good time, and we all agree. Many of those students and their families have travel plans. And we all know that travel is going to create some risk. So parents are looking for direction and advice. Question. So through you, Speaker, does the government have any advice for parents um, about this March break in travel? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Education. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Indeed, uh, many parents and students may be traveling on the eve of March break. And, Speaker, uh, as I noted in the prior question, uh, we are encouraging all citizens, including, of course, staff and citizens, to strictly adhere to the guidelines set by both the province and the federal government with respect to travel, informed by the Chief Medical Health Officer of Ontario and Canada with respect to travel and isolation protocols to ensure students and staff returning from March break remain safe. That is the paramount priority, I think, of all members of this legislature, united to ensure citizens of this province uh, travel safely and adhere to those precautions as mentioned by the Chief Medical Health Officer. Yesterday, I convened a meeting of all ministers of education across the country uh, on my request to help ensure that there's a dialogue, a national dialogue, about how we can ensure that we take action to combat this virus and ensure the safety of all citizens in Canada. Response. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member from Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Landing a good job, Mr. Speaker, is not just about a paycheck. It also gives people purpose and dignity. Everyone is better off when people are working. For too many people across the province, it is hard to put a roof over their head. At a time when Ontario has a talented, skilled and dedicated workforce with so much to offer, can the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development please tell this House how we're helping laid-off manufacturer workers find work? Question to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank the uh, member for Milton for that uh, excellent and important question. Mr. Speaker, we are helping manufacturing workers retrain and get jobs faster. <laughs> I firmly believe that with the right kind of training and support, people and businesses can have great opportunities in our ever-changing economy. On Tuesday, I was pleased to meet Max Sood. He was an electrician in India and came to Ontario with $500 in his pocket. After 16 years, he was laid off from his job at a textile company. Through our second career program, he retrained, got a diploma, and now has an excellent job. In his own words, Maxud says that his dream came true right here in Canada. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we need more stories like Maxud's, and we're going to continue uh, to work with all of our Response. workers right across the province so they have the best opportunities possible. A supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. I am pleased to hear that our government is committed to supporting our manufacturing workers and creating opportunities for them. Mr. Speaker, it's important to remember that jobs are about people. Every time there is a lay layoff, workers, their families, and their communities are impacted. Can the minister please share with this House how he is making it easier for laid-off workers to get back to work sooner? Yes, sir. Well, thank you again for that question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last year, the second career program helped train more than 3,800 people. This program offers assistance not only with training, but also for related costs like books and transportation. But I agree that we need to make it work sooner and better for Ontario's workers. Recently, with the member for Cambridge and the member for Kitchener South Hespler, I announced that we ended the delay for laid off manufacturing workers to get retrained in Ontario. 
We are adapting the program to make it work better for the people of this province. Mr. Speaker, we will always stand with the working men and women of this province because when everyone can contribute to the economy, our communities and our province can prosper. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Recently, the Premier was heartbroken that there won't be PC blue plates on every Ontario vehicle. But, Speaker, this issue isn't heartbreaking. It's absurd and mind-boggling. It's so mind-boggling that even one of this government's former top officials, Jenny Byrne, weighed in publicly and said, quote, there is no defending it. This issue was managed absolutely terribly. I can't imagine how it could have been managed worse, end quote. Ms. Byrne went on to say, Quote, the government seemingly defended this license plate issue for three days. This was the hill they were going to die on, and then it became evident four days, five days in, that it wasn't going away and there actually was a problem with the license plates. End quote. Speaker, she's not wrong. And inquiring minds want to know, what will be tomorrow's hill to die on for this Premier? Will it be billboards, or could it be something like autism services, clean drinking water, affordable housing, or public health? Question. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, obviously, for us, uh, the, what we're doing right now is we're focused on uh, on the economy. We're focused on COVID-19. That's here, here. Uh, the priority of this government, and I, I can appreciate uh, the role that the opposition has in both uh, supporting the government in times of uh, of, uh, of a health emergency and also extracting accountability, uh, Mr. Speaker. But I'm sure the member opposite can appreciate uh, that we will continue to focus on what matters most to the people of Ontario, and that's the health and safety of uh, of, uh, of all Ontarians and communities across the province. Well, Okay. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This strange winding road we've all been on with the Premier's handpicked party plates has captivated the attention of folks across the province. It has been a weird circus that never should have happened. This Premier's heartbreak, however, doesn't seem like a good enough reason to bury the costs and details of these party blue license plates. I have asked repeatedly. And the government has dodged repeatedly, but Ontario still deserves the answer. How can this government justify using a non-disclosure agreement to hide their self-serving misuse of public money? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to assure everyone in this House and everyone watching today that we are working with our stakeholders and we're working with the vendor in terms of delivering a product that addresses the concerns that we have taken very seriously. And again, I appreciate that people felt that they could speak to us, share the concerns, and Ontarians should feel confident that they have a government that is actually responding and acting on those concerns. And I can tell you, Speaker, that our focus is absolutely on delivering an enhanced plate that meets the highest standards. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the acting premier. I want to first thank the premier for hosting an all-party meeting for a briefing on COVID-19 yesterday, and I want to thank the leader of the opposition for pushing to have the meeting. I think it's really important at this moment in time that we work across party lines, and I also think it's important that all Ontarians work together to care for each other. So as we all work hard to contain COVID-19, health experts are saying that if you're showing symptoms, self-quarantine. The bottom line is, if you're sick, stay home. But, Speaker, many Ontarians cannot afford to stay home. We've been seeing articles in the newspapers about people struggling. Are they going to pay the rent or you know, stay home? So, Speaker, I'm going to ask the acting premier Will the government commit to a paid sick and emergency leave program so people can self-quarantine without fear of not being able to pay their rent or mortgage or put food Question. on the table? Question. Thank you. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as, uh, and I again, uh, thank uh, the Honourable Member for, uh, uh, for attending a briefing yesterday. As the, the member knows, the initial uh, uh, initial response was $100 million, which, was, which goes to uh, protecting the health and safety of, uh, of those who are dealing with it on the front line. We are obviously working very closely with our federal partners to ensure that uh, uh, Ontarians and Canadians more broadly uh, are protected in this. I know the federal government has announced a number of measures through uh, employment insurance uh, to make it easier and quicker for, uh, 
uh, Ontarians uh, who are impacted by COVID-19 to access uh, uh, support. And as the Minister of Finance uh, said yesterday, uh, uh, we are monitoring the situation, the economic situation, very, very closely, uh, not only across Ontario but with our partners uh, uh, across the country to ensure that we can respond uh, to, uh, to that once we have the health care situation uh, uh, under control across, uh, across Ontario. But obviously, uh, we are going to continue to work with the federal government and for all, with all Response. members uh, to ensure that Ontarians uh, are safe and secure in this time. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the House Leader's response, Speaker, but self-quarantining, staying home from work when you're sick, is directly related to public health. Public health officials are saying if you're sick, stay home. But not all workers can afford to stay home. As a matter of fact, EI supports don't always benefit people who are in the hospitality industry, the service industry, and the gig economy. I was just reading an article in the National Post this morning about workers saying they are going to go to work even if they're sick because they can't afford not to. And so while I would like to see a permanent reversal of the government's move to cancel paid sick days and sick notes, I'm wondering if the minister would at least agree to a temporary program to support workers to stay home while we're trying to contain COVID-19. Again, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As, uh, as I said in, uh, in my uh, initial response, uh, uh, the Premier, the Minister of Finance, and the Minister of Health are uh, in Ottawa today, uh, meeting with the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and with premiers across uh, across Canada. Uh, many of the premiers, uh, the member will know, share uh, some of the, the same uh, same concerns. We understand that across the economy, there are impacts which will uh, which will be felt, and that different uh, areas of the economy are. are uh, impacted in, in, a, in a different way, but as we said, the initial investment of $100 million is first and foremost to ensure the safety and security of those people who are dealing with, the, with this on the front line. The federal government has made some initial moves to, uh, uh, to assist through employment uh, insurance, uh, uh, and we will continue to monitor the situation so that, uh, uh, so that Ontarians uh, can be assured that we not only will we get through this, uh, but we'll get through this together, Mr. Speaker. But I think it also highlights the need uh, uh, to ensure that the province is always on a sound fiscal footing, and I, I appreciate the fact that we've been able to do that in 18 short months. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I know how devastating bullying can be on a child. Today in the le legislature, I have a very special visitor who has been dealing with some bullies at his school. He's a young, bright, wonderful person. He and all other victims of bullying do not deserve such treatment. We know that the longer a child is bullied, the more likely they are to develop physical, emotional, and psychological scars that can last a lifetime. That should never happen. We need to learn from these incidents and take action to protect our children. Can the Minister of Education Please tell us how the government is combating the bullying issues uh, that we have in Ontario schools and what we can do uh, to stop this problem in the province of Ontario. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the question from, uh, from the member for Willowdale. And let me just uh, 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 reach out to the, to, to, uh, the guest that he's brought with him today just to tell him that uh, not only on this side, but all members of this House. Uh, uh, stand with him constantly. Uh, this is something that we all agree on that uh, uh, should not be taking place in the province of Ontario. I know that uh, uh, the Minister of Education has been working very closely uh, across party lines uh, to address this very real problem uh, uh, in, uh, in schools across the, the province of Ontario. Listen, I have uh, uh, two young daughters, uh, and often uh, I hear some of the stories that they bring back and they, and they recount, and, and, and I wish I could say that they weren't on occasion themselves the, the victims uh, uh, of bullying. And as a parent, it, it breaks your heart. Uh, but as a parliamentarian, it, uh, it makes me want to redouble my efforts to work across the floor and with my colleagues to make sure that we educate, uh, educate our students, educate and work with our, uh, our, our school uh, partners to make sure that we can put an end to this. And again, to the honorable uh, young man who joins us uh, in, the, in, the, in the galleries, uh, thank you so much for being here and, and having the courage to share your story with us. The supplementary question. Stop the clock.
restart the clock. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I'm glad to hear the government House Leader and this government indeed does take the issue of bullying very, very seriously. And, and, and I'd like to thank, through you, Mr. Speaker, the government House Leader, for recognizing that the, the topic of bullying is a nonpartisan issue and that I encourage all members of this House to work together to provide constructive ideas on how we can eradicate this problem for good uh, in our schools here in the province. No kid should ever have to go through bullying. And this government is committed to making sure that we get rid of it in our schools, we get rid of it in our societies, uh, and I look forward to those constructive discussions. Speaker, I was wondering if the government House Leader can provide some other examples of, of what we're working on in government to prevent bullying uh, and how we can help each other to get rid of this problem once and for all. Thank you. Government House Leader, your uh, Again, uh, let me just thank the member for Willowdale for the, uh, for the question. Uh, uh, our government is taking action to combat bullying, uh, uh, but the member is correct. Uh, we need to learn more about the systemic challenges surrounding bullying uh, so we can drill down and focus our attention accordingly to combat it. In November, the minister announced uh, the assignment of the member for Scarborough Centre, who is a former teacher, to advise on education matters with a focus on bullying prevention. And uh, I know that we are all uh, we all value that advice. Uh, the government will also be conduct a province-wide online survey survey to better understand students' experiences with bullying, and we will conduct a review of school reporting practices on bullying and a review of the definition of bullying in ministry policies to ensure it reflects the realities of today. We are working to change the culture uh, to one where everyone sees inherent dignity and the value of a person, irrespective of their faith heritage, orientation, race, or income. Response. Uh, and just finally, again, Mr. Speaker, just on a day that we're all uh, uh, thinking of a lot of different things to, again, congratulate and thank the, uh, uh, the young man who joins us today for uh, his courage in bringing this forward. Thank you. The next question, the member for Muskego Walk, James Bay. More home, Mr. Thank you, Speaker. Two months ago, almost day by day, three people died on the winter road collision on Highway 11 and 17 near the junction of, with Highway 102 in Thunder Bay. Every single time that a, a fatal accident like this, one, there's a family that is torn apart. There are people in the entire region that comes to a halt. Speaker, when questioned about the state of Northern Ontario roads uh, maintenance, the minister indicated that the Highway 11 and 17 are cleared of snow in an average seven hours. Well, it came as a shock to someone who routinely, routinely drives those highways. That is less than what it takes to clear 401, Speaker. Can the Acting Premier explain the seven hours when Northern Ontarians see roads packed with snow and ice every single day? The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, the member for the question. Certainly, safety is the number one priority for the Ministry of Transportation, as well as all the members in the House. And Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Transportation has been working very, very diligently over a number of years uh, to improve uh, winter maintenance, uh, uh, snow removal across our northern communities, uh, such as working with contractors, uh, greater over, uh, oversight with contractors, as well as working with contractors so that they have the equipment necessary so that they can remove snow as quickly as possible. I will continue to work with members opposite to ensure uh, that all drivers on our, on our highways are safe and that we ensure our roads continue to be rated amongst the safest in North America. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, thank you for the, explaining the seven hours. Speaker, people may say that our highways have always been treacherous and risky. But since the Liberal government privatized the winter maintenance system and enforced performance-based area maintenance contract in 2009, things have gone from risky to deadly. And to be fair, the, the member of Nipissing made himself a name by telling the then Minister of Transportation and now the leader of the Ontario Liberals that driving conditions in the North are disgraceful. Yet neither the member from Nipissing nor any of the, follow, uh, the fellow Northern Ministers want to pull back from the Liberal Area Maintenance Contract mess. Acting Premier, can you tell Northern Ontarians if your government is satisfied with the Liberal infamous Area Maintenance Contract? Yes or no? Minister. 
Again, I, I thank the member for the question, and, I get, and again, I want to reiterate that safety is the number one priority for the Ministry of Transportation. Certainly, is the uh, number one priority for our cabinet members and our members of caucus that represent uh, northern communities. What I want to remind the member opposite is that his very own party voted against. Uh, in estimates, an additional $40 million to keep our northern roads safe. Maybe you should explain that to your constituents. Order. Order. The next question. Order. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Energy. As a parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, I've had the privilege to meet with farmers across the province. They tell me that energy is one of the largest inputs on farms. They tell me that access to a natural gas will help boost the competitiveness of rural Ontario communities, businesses, and farms. And they're right. Could the associate minister please explain how the natural gas expansion support program is supporting farmers and rural communities across Ontario? The associate minister of energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs for a great question and his work on behalf of our province's agricultural community. Alongside our great Minister of Government and Consumer Services, I had the pleasure of launching Phase 2 of the Natural Gas Expansion Support Program at Snowblin Farms near Lucknow, which was connected to natural gas through Phase 1 of the program. Sam Snowblin, president of Snowblin Farms, said, and I quote, we have competitors that are serviced with natural gas. It put us at a real disadvantage during the real strike where there was no propane available. They could keep their elevators and facilities running because they had natural gas and we didn't. So we're going to be right back up on the level playing field, Mr. Speaker. That's huge news for people like the Snowblins. Mr. Speaker, our government knows that access to natural gas drives down costs, increases competitiveness, and provides certainty for farmers and creates jobs across the province. And we're excited about phase two. Here, here. That's not the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for his response. Rural Ontario could simply not win on a Del Duca Liberals. About four years ago, they tried to effectively ban natural gas. No, we haven't forgotten. I've long spoken up for better access to natural gas in Perth, Wellington, in places like Perth East and the Township of Mapleton, to name just a few. And I'll continue speaking up for those without access to natural gas. It's refreshing that our government has a plan to support rural, remote, and Indigenous communities throughout, through the Natural Gas uh, Expansion Support Program. Could the Associate Minister please tell us what communities are saying about this government's program? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And again, a great question from the Honourable Member from Perth Wellington. After years of neglect from the Del Duca Liberals, municipalities across rural Ontario are excited about our government's plan to build Ontario together. Communities connected through Phase 1 of the program are incredibly excited about the potential that these projects have for residents and businesses. Chief Kelly LaRocca of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island said that the project in her community will, and I quote, provide the community with a more affordable and environmentally friendly way to heat homes and businesses. Darren Caniff, Mayor of Chatham Kent, said that the project in his community is, and I quote, vital because it allows for the immediate development and expansion of businesses in the community. We continue to hear from numerous municipalities that are keen to submit new projects through phase two, and we're encouraging those communities to partner with a natural gas utility to do so before June 4th of this year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to continuing the program. The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Speaker, my question is to the acting premier, the government house leader. Good morning, sir. Speaker, flooding on our lakes and rivers has turned many dreams into nightmares in southwestern Ontario. State of emergency has been declared along Erie Shore Drive in Chatham-Kent. Homeowners there have had to evacuate. They don't know if they'll ever be able to return to their homes. The banks and cliffs are eroding and falling into Lake Erie at Wheatley Provincial Park. A dike has breached in the Hillman Marsh in Leamington for safety reasons. The OPP have closed the street to traffic in Bell River. Windsor has had to spend $5 million at our municipal marina to build floating docks because of the high water level. Speaker. This government slashed funding for flood response in their previous budget. Will they reverse those cuts in the new budget expected later this month? Government House Leader. 
thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from, uh, from the Honourable Gentleman. As, uh, as uh, the member will know, uh, the Minister of Natural Resources uh, uh, convened a, a panel to investigate and to provide advice to the, to the government with respect to a, a new flood strategy for the province of Ontario. The member is quite correct. Uh, for uh, a number of years, for 15 long years, uh, 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 this was something that was uh, virtually ignored by the previous government. We're trying to catch up in many instances. So the panel, which was convened by uh, uh, Mr. Doug McNeil, has come back with a number of, uh, uh, of recommendations uh, for the government. Look, we know that we can't prevent uh, flooding, but we can certainly put in place the policies that help to reduce it uh, in, in, in many instances. And that means working with our federal and uh, municipal partners. Uh, it means working on, uh, on, on uh, ensuring that developments don't occur near, uh, near flood zones. We're going to continue to work on that. We're going to continue to work uh, uh, through the recommendations of the panel. Response. And, uh, uh, ensure that uh, all communities are, are safe and secure and that we catch up to, uh, to the work that hadn't been done for 15 years. If it's correct, the government recently released their flood strategy, but their strategy seems to be, well, we've studied it. We know flooding is a problem, but we're not going to do anything about it. In fact, their flood strategy doesn't come with one single nickel of funding, not a nickel. Wow. Despite being told by their expert advisor, more funding is badly needed. The climate crisis in Ontario is in full swing. This government seems to be content pretending the problem will fix itself. Well, it won't, and our constituents deserve better. Speaker, will the government agree to a reverse course and restore the funding they cut from flood mitigation programs in southwestern Ontario? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, we, we just heard that uh, for 15 long years, not much was done on this file. So certainly we're not going to reverse course and go back to a time when uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Del Duca Liberals uh, failed the province of Ontario often with the support of the NDP, Mr. Speaker, we're going to move forward. Uh, we are working very closely with our municipal, with our municipal Order. friends. The minister has brought forward uh, a strategy through the work of uh, Mr. McNeil. We've made significant investments uh, across uh, the province already. We're going to continue to make more investments by working with our municipal and federal partners to get the job done. I know the Minister of Infrastructure has a number of projects that, uh, uh, that we are awaiting approval from the federal government on. Obviously, uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, focus on working with our partners to ensure that all communities are, uh, uh, are safe and that, uh, and that individuals can uh, have the confidence that the government of Ontario is moving forward with a strategy that will work after 15 years of neglect. Thank you. The next question, the member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the my question is for the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Speaker, last year the Honorable David only completed the, his review of the AODO, that means Accessibility for Ontarian with Disability Act. Mr. Only's report not only cited the sole crushing barriers faced every day by Ontarian with disability, but he also noted that the previous government falls short in taking action. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what he is doing to get accessibility back on track after 15 years of the Del Duca Liberal allowing us to fall behind? Questions to the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for this excellent question. Mr. Speaker, our government is taking action now. In January, I announced advancing accessibility in Ontario. Our government's plan to get accessibility, accessibility back in on track. This plan includes breaking down barriers in built environment. The government leading by example in its role as a policymaker, service provider, and employer. Increasing participation in the economy for people with disabilities and improving understanding and awareness about accessibility. Unlike the Del Duca Liberals, Response. we will now waste no time. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Minister, for that answer, and, uh, and uh, thank you for your, all the great work, because the accessibility is a very important uh, piece of our legislature, and also it's a, it's, a, it's a retrofitting the current building, and you and me will talk about those issues. It's a great issue our government to taking action to advance accessibility in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the minister give us some more specific example of how this plan will help to remove barriers of Ontarian with the disabilities. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, again. Our government is taking quick action with the practical measures to break down barriers. One step we have taken, which I'm very proud of, is our new partnership with the Ontario Building Officials Association, or OBOA. With our support, the OBOA is developing a new training course in accessibility and universal design so that municipal building officials across Ontario can all become accessibility champions. Mr. Speaker, I will have more to announce soon because unlike the Del Duca Liberals, Response. we are taking action now. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Uh, speaker, people in the riding of Sudbury and of Nickel Belt and across Northern Ontario have waited over 14 years for the completion of the four laning of Highway 69, and they're frustrated. Expanding this highway is vital for safe and reliable access to Ontario's north, and there are only 68 kilometres left, Speaker, but we still don't know when the project will be completed. The Sudbury Chamber of Commerce's budget recommendation continues to urge the government to expedite the completion of the four laning of Highway 69. The economic prosperity of our region depends on there being no further delays. Why is the government continuing to leave Northerners in the dark on when four laning Highway 69 will finally be completed? The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you very much uh, to the member for the question. And in this House, I just want to again thank our very strong advocates, our, our cabinet members and caucus members that advocate for uh, Northern Ontarians every single day in this House. Mr. Speaker, we've already invested $850 million to complete 70 kilometres of this project. We've also committed an additional $200 million uh, in terms of initiating the, the construction. Mr. Speaker, our government has been very clear that we believe in investing money in critical infrastructure, infrastructure, whether it's highway infrastructure or public transit, we are making those, those key investments. We're spending $2.3 billion alone uh, this year to invest in our uh, highway network across the province of Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. Uh, the concern here is the cost of demobilizing and remobilizing if we don't uh, complete it now. Last year, I asked a similar question to the Minister of Transportation. When people in my riding could expect to see, to see the four lane Highway 69 completed, and the Minister told me to look forward to the upcoming budget, the 2019 budget. But last year's budget had no new funding and no timeline for completion. Will the Premier continue to string people along in Northern Ontario like the Liberals did for more than a decade? Or will you listen to the people of Sudbury, the people of Nickel Belt, and to the Ch Sudbury Chamber of Commerce and commit to making Highway 69 a priority in the 2020 budget? We release the funding needed to start the work on the last 68 kilometres of Highway 69 as soon as possible. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've already announced that Highway 69 is a priority for this government, and we've backed that commitment uh, with $850 million and another $200 million. That is a significant amount of uh, financial investment, but again, we are investing $2.3 billion across the province of Ontario uh, in terms of highway infrastructure to improve our highway network so that we can get Ontarians moving again. Thank you. Next question, member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Last week, the Solicitor General and the Minister of Women and Children's Issue launched our new comprehensive cross-government strategy to tackle the crime of human trafficking in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through my experience while meeting with constituents and community leaders in Brampton, I have come to understand the scale of human trafficking. This is not only a dominant issue, it is an epidemic issue. 
and we all have a role to play in the fight against human trafficking, which is why my question focuses on the cross-government part of this strategy. Can the Solicitor General share how our strategy allows for broad participation across many ministries and sectors? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Brampton West. You know, he's absolutely right. The, uh, the initiative that Premier Ford has um, tasked us with is actually something that hits many ministries and we are working collaboratively with it. It's important that while we ensure that individuals who are being uh, sex trafficked or in labour trafficked are removed from those terrible situations, we also need to have the supports in place to support, treat and ultimately um, pass them through the uh, court system for the, the individuals who are recruiting individuals. Uh, it's, it's an important piece of what we have to do, and it's really unfortunate that the member from Hamilton doesn't understand that the average age of human trafficking is the same age as these pages. Oh. So if you would actually listen for a minute and start to understand Order. what kind of commitment we are making. Order. I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, thank you to the Solicitor General for the response. This is really a critically important issue, and it's clear that our government is stepping up to the plate. Of course, tackling human trafficking requires supporting our law enforcement partners to ensure that offenders can be held accountable and brought to justice. This is not always easy, given that human trafficking is a complex, province-wide crime that often includes ties to other forms of organized crime. Speaker, can the Solicitor General explain how our government's new anti-human trafficking strategy supports the theme of holding offenders accountable and builds on our government's work to support police services? Solicitor General, to reply. Thank you. And thank you for the members' interest in this issue. I know that there are many, many colleagues who understand the importance of why, or why we are taking a government-wide approach. It, uh, it really speaks to the commitment that we have made, the investments that we are making, both in Solicitor General, in Attorney General, and of course in Children and Youth, which has been the largest investment that we have announced. It, uh, it strikes me as strange that the members opposite would choose to try to politicize this issue when historically we have worked very, very cooperatively as members, as parents, as parliamentarians. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. And for this week as well. I'm going to ask our pages to now assemble. It's now time to say a word of thanks to our legislative pages for the outstanding work that they've done over the last almost four weeks. Our pages are smart, trustworthy, and hardworking. They are indispensable to the effective functioning of the chamber. They cheerfully and efficiently deliver notes, run errands, transport important documents throughout the precinct, and make sure that our water glasses are always full. We are indeed fortunate to have them here. Our pages depart having made many new friends with a greater understanding of parliamentary democracy and memories that will last them a lifetime. Each of them will go home and carry on, continue their studies, and will no doubt contribute to their communities, their province, and their country in important ways. We expect great things from all of you. Maybe some of you will someday take your seats in this House as members or work here as staff. And we wish all of you well. Please join me in showing our appreciation to this group of legislative people.
Now back to work. <laughs> I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 101C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Mr. Yard assumes ballot item number eight and Ms. Singh, Brampton Centre, assumes ballot item, item number 85. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Oshawa has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the government house leader concerning the use of a non-disclosure agreement. This matter will be debated Tuesday, March 24, 2020. We now have a deferred vote on a motion for second reading of Bill 181, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2020. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
Okay. I'm going to ask the members to please take their seats. March 11, 2020, Mr. Bethlenthalvi moved second reading of Bill 181, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2020. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Kalander. Mr. Kalander. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith Bay Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay Quincy. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Tanny Gas. Mr. Tanny Gas. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Babbitt. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kusendova. Ms. Kusendova. Mrs. Tanger. Mrs. Tanger. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Carahalis. Mrs. Carahalis. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Gazzetto. Mr. Gazzetto. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Anthropolopoulos. Mr. Anthropolopoulos. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Balma. Mr. Balma. Mr. Smith Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Smith Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Gamari. Mr. Gamari. Mr. Canapathy. Mr. Canapathy. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Madame Jelen. Madame Jelen. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Shubhi Song. Ms. Shubhi Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Mrs. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrews. Ms. Andrews. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Borgwen. Mr. Borgwen. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosa. Mr. Rakosa. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. The ayes are 58, the nays are 34. The ayes being 58, the nays being 34, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, Jose Lecture du Projet de Loi. Pursuant to Standing Order 67, this bill is ordered for third reading. G181, third reading of Bill 181, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2020. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Government House Leader. Thank you, Speaker. I move uh, third reading of Bill 181, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Mr. Calandra has moved third reading of Bill 181, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2020. Pursuant to Standing Order 67, I am required to put the question, is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Oh, Heard some no's. All those in favour of the motion will please say aye. aye. Those opposed will please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be another five minute bell. Same vote. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 58, the nays are 34. The ayes being 58 and the nays being 34, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There being no further business in the House this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.